In an undercover video, two doctors from Wuhan shed light on the Chinese regime's virus cover-up. The U.S. signals plans for a continued tough stance on China. That's as an advisor to Biden talks about using strategic patience in approaching the issue. A young man in China dies a slow death after living in severe poverty, just weeks after Chinese authorities declared the country poverty-free. And China's trade war with Australia appears to be backfiring. Australian exports to China reportedly soared in December. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Unusual reports coming from the Chinese regime are sparking questions online. According to Beijing, various samples of food, drink and other imported goods are testing positive for the CCP or Chinese Communist Party virus. Items that have tested positive include ice cream, seafood, cherries, beer, auto parts and even slippers. The one thing they have in common, all were imported from other countries. Some environmental samples collected from restrooms also reportedly came back positive. But the seemingly far-fetched reports are striking a chord with some Chinese netizens. Referring to Chinese authorities, one user wrote, You've investigated imported food clearly enough, but why can't you trace the origins of the virus to the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Another netizen commented, one cannot rule out the possibility that the pandemic can't be covered up anymore. So authorities use imported ice cream to shake off their responsibility. Others say they suspect there's another reason behind officials' reports. Another user explained he suspects Beijing is using the influx of positive test results to promote vaccines. Now to Shanghai, China's largest megacity. The city's health commission board says 30 new patients have tested positive for a second time. That's after all 30 had previously been sickened and later recovered from the infection. Authorities didn't say whether the patients were reinfected with the same virus strain they had before or a new variant. We can't independently verify the figures. The Chinese regime has a track record of underreporting virus cases. An undercover video has caught the public eye. It may shed light on Communist China's reported cover-up of the virus. In it, two Wuhan doctors say Chinese authorities knew as early as December 2019 that the CCP virus could be transmitted from person to person, but told medical staff to keep the information quiet. Beijing didn't admit human-to-human transmission was possible until January 20, 2020. UK media outlet ITV filmed the undercover video as part of a documentary on the virus. The two doctors shown in the video are from Wuhan, where the infection is widely thought to have come from. The documentary says the doctors witnessed some of the country's first virus cases. One explained that a relative of someone he knows died from the virus in late December or early January, adding that many of those who lived with the person were also infected. The other doctors said, quote, We knew this virus transmitted from human to human, but when we attended a hospital meeting, we were told not to speak out. The provincial leaders told the hospitals not to tell the truth. The doctors also mentioned authorities knew that 2020's New Year's celebrations would speed up the spread of the virus, but they didn't sound the alarm, allowing scheduled events to go on as planned. That's because, quote, such an event would present a harmonious and prosperous society. Lawmakers from a number of Western countries are calling on the CCP to release citizen journalists jailed for covering the pandemic. NTD's Becky Jo has the story. Parliament members from 14 countries are expressing concerns last week about the sentencing of a Chinese citizen journalist. Journalist Zhang Zhan is set to serve four years in a Chinese prison, but the parliament members urge Beijing to release her and all others detained in connection with their reporting. Zhang is the first journalist jailed for shedding light on the Chinese regime's virus cover-up. The 14 politicians come from the U.S., Canada, the U.K., Germany, Switzerland, Denmark, and other European nations. They are members of an international group called the Media Freedom Coalition. It aims to ensure safety for journalists around the world and to hold authoritarian regimes accountable. Some Chinese citizens are also criticizing the sentence. This is heart-wrenching because she didn't do anything wrong, just reported on the pandemic in Wuhan and expressed her opinions. She was sentenced to four years in jail. This is ridiculous. Zhang shared videos online about what was happening in Wuhan, the epicenter of the CCP virus pandemic during the first surge of virus cases. Her first-hand accounts of crowded hospitals, empty streets and local interviews painted a dire picture of the city. 
This kind of coverage could not be seen on China's state-run media. Chinese police detained the 37-year-old last May. Her lawyer said she was found guilty of picking quarrels and provoking trouble last December. It's a charge often used for those who disrupt the communist regime's narrative, including Chinese human rights activists and reporters. Reporting by Becky Zhou, NTD News. A young man in China dies a slow death after living in severe poverty. His story emerges just weeks after the Chinese Communist Party declared China as poverty-free. Hear more from NTD's Don Ma. Another quiet tragedy has struck China. Weekend news reports detail the death of a young man in China. That's owing to his living in extreme poverty. The circumstances surrounding his death come in sharp contrast to claims made by the Chinese Communist Party, which is that poverty has been eradicated from the country. The young man was in his 20s when he passed away. He had no family due to the deaths of his grandparents and his father's decision to disown him. He endured severe poverty throughout his life. Medical problems made him too weak to work in labor, and he couldn't afford to get an education. With no other options, he took up posting videos online in hopes of making a living. Similar to YouTubers, he called himself Ink T. But unlike mainstream YouTubers, he made very little money from his content creation. Online, he described being unable to afford things most people take for granted. In one post, he wrote about wishing he could eat strawberries, but explained they were too expensive for him to buy. Ink T also had a medical condition to manage, diabetes. Normal treatments mean the condition isn't life-threatening, but unable to afford medical care, his illness worsened to the point where he could no longer eat, a condition that eventually led to his death. His poverty forced him to purchase medicine one tablet at a time, as health care in the country often excludes the extremely poor. Aware of his own situation, Ink T knew his life was coming to an end. He wrote online that he would cherish the days he had left. China Issues commentator and cultural scholar Wen Zhao said Ink T's calm attitude towards death stemmed from acceptance that he faced a hopeless situation. On December 31st, Ink T wrote his last post online, explaining that he was on his deathbed. He passed away in his apartment alone sometime later. Ink T's story comes amid Beijing's claims that poverty no longer exists in China. Last year, Chinese state media claimed that the country's entire population had been lifted out of poverty. Reports went on to say China had achieved a miracle in human history. Ink T's case isn't unprecedented. Another similar tragedy struck last year. That's when a young Chinese woman passed away after living on pennies a day. She died from heart and kidney problems after eating too little food for five years. She was so malnourished that at one point, she weighed about only 40 pounds. Don Ma, NTD News. The White House signals it plans to continue the U.S.'s hardline stance against China. It's a response to recent comments from the head of the Chinese Communist Party, who spoke at the World Economic Forum. We're starting from a, 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 an approach of patience as it relates to our relationship with China. At the event, Chinese leader Xi Jinping called on countries to cast aside what he called ideological prejudice and to, quote, reject the outdated Cold War mentality in an effort to fight global challenges. But Saki said these comments don't change anything. She added that the Biden administration's approach on China remains what it has been for the last months, if not longer. She said the White House seeks to tackle China's threats with its own methods, explaining it aims to play a better defense. That includes holding Beijing accountable for unfair practices, protecting U.S. data, and maintaining the United States' technological edge. Former Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe responded to a remark from Press Secretary Jen Psaki. In a briefing, she said the Biden administration would approach China, quote, with some strategic patience. Ratcliffe told Fox News on Monday that existing intelligence supports the Trump administration's tough-on-China policies. Ratcliffe said, quote, the intelligence doesn't say we should have patience with respect to China. It says we should act with respect to China. The Chinese Communist Party has expressed hope for closer U.S.-China relations under the Biden administration, likely aiming to revert back to a time before President Trump set his hardline policies in motion. Among the policy reversals, China may be seeking out the Taiwan issue. It's not yet clear how the new U.S. government will handle the subject. 
In the last days of the Trump administration, former U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo took action on Taiwan, lifting all restrictions on contacts between U.S. officials and their Taiwanese counterparts. The move angered Beijing. Pompeo said for several decades the U.S. had created the internal restrictions, quote, in an attempt to appease the communist regime in Beijing. An associate professor who focuses on diplomacy and international relations at a Taiwan university told state-owned broadcaster the Central News Agency that he doesn't believe U.S.-Taiwan relations will change a lot in the short term. That's because he says Biden will likely focus on domestic issues first. Graham Allison, an international relations expert and one of Biden's advisors, also commented on the subject. He told Taiwan-based TV station TVBS last Monday that, quote, Biden understands that there is only one China. There is no ambiguity about one China. The capital of one China is Beijing. There is not an independent country called Taiwan. Allison added that Biden needs to work out a new Taiwan policy. The U.S. and China have followed the one country, two systems model for decades when it comes to Hong Kong and Taiwan. In the model, one country refers to mainland China, while two systems refers to the region's separate governance models. The communist or socialist system in mainland China and the democratic free system embraced by Hong Kong and Taiwan. The model is supposed to assure the two systems of government exist parallel to each other and that mainland China doesn't squash freedoms in Hong Kong and Taiwan. But for years, mainland China has sought to take back control over Taiwan. Britain returned Hong Kong to China in 1997 under the promise of the one country, two systems model. But gradually, Beijing has shifted toward a one country, one system model. With the passing of Beijing's national security law over Hong Kong last year, that process has sped up. And many fear the rule of law and freedoms there are being eroded. Taiwan is officially called the Republic of China. It was established in 1912 in mainland China and ruled China until 1949. That's when the communist regime, now known as the People's Republic of China, took over the region. The Republic of China since retreated to the island of Taiwan. Now Taiwan remains a democratic country. But because the U.S. and the United Nations don't recognize it as an independent country, Taiwan is labeled by the international community as a region in China. Now we look to Taiwan's Air Force. Taiwan's Air Force had a war simulation on Tuesday. Many of its fighter jets flew into the sky to show the fleet's battle readiness. This comes after dozens of People's Liberation Army, or PLA, warplanes from Communist China flew into Taiwan's air defense zone over the weekend. The air base in the southern city of Tainan often has to send warplanes to intercept PLA jets intruding into Taiwan's airspace. A Taiwanese Air Force colonel says their jets usually go up armed with guns, sidewinders, and Taiwan-made sky sword missiles when reacting to PLA jets. They can respond at any time. Now we turn to U.S.-Japan relations. The new U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin had his first talk with his Japanese counterparts last Saturday. Secretary Austin confirmed Washington's commitment to the U.S.-Japan alliance. Austin also confirmed that the U.S. would help defend Japan if a group of disputed islands in the East China Sea is under attack. Japan calls the island the Senkakus, while the CCP refers to them as the Diaoyi. Both sides claim the islands as their own, and Japan has become increasingly concerned as the CCP repeatedly sent vessels near the islands. In a statement, the Pentagon says the U.S. opposes any, quote, unilateral attempts to change the status quo in the East China Sea. Now we look to China's trade war with Australia. The trade war appears to be backfiring on China. This past December, Australia reported its fourth highest monthly trade surplus ever. This is thanks to strong demand for Australian exports. Despite China's high tariffs on Australian goods, Australia exported a lot more goods to China in December. Australian exports to China soared by about 2 billion U.S. dollars, or one-fifth, in December, compared to the previous month. This was driven primarily by iron ore and wheat. Total iron ore exports increased by 15 percent. Due to higher prices in the international iron market, China paid about 10 percent more per ton for iron ore in December than in November. In comparison, Australian imports from China fell by 500 million U.S. dollars, or 7 percent. Australia-China Relations Institute director James Lawrenson told a newspaper, The Australian, that Beijing has been, quote, unable or unwilling to wean itself of low-cost, high-quality Australian iron ore. 
The trade surplus comes despite Chinese sanctions on a number of Australian goods, such as beef, wine, barley, lobster, timber and coal. And Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison says while he's open to discussing issues with China, he won't do it on the basis of bowing to Beijing's demands. Prime Minister Morrison says, quote, I don't think any Australian would want their prime minister to be conceding the points that they've set out. This comes after Australia's opposition leader called on Morrison to consult predecessors on resetting relations with China. The relationship between the two countries is at its lowest point in recent years. After Australia's foreign minister called for an investigation into the origins of the CCP virus. The CCP responded with an unofficial trade war on Australian imports. CCP officials blame Australia for the souring relationship, and the Chinese embassy there listed 14 grievances with Australia. The regime says it wants these issues addressed before having diplomatic conversations with Prime Minister Morrison. Now we turn from Australia to its neighbour New Zealand. There is a new deal between New Zealand and Communist China. The two countries sign a trade deal this Tuesday. It's an upgrade of an existing free trade pact. And the deal would give New Zealand exports greater access to the Chinese market. China is now New Zealand's largest trading partner. Trade between the two totals over $20 billion. In the new deal, China reduced tariffs for many imports from New Zealand, such as dairy, timber and seafood. The deal would also open certain sectors of the Chinese market, such as aviation and finance, to New Zealand. In return, New Zealand would give out more visas to Chinese language teachers and tour guides. Taiwan's biggest chipmaker is stepping up to help the auto industry, as global car makers have had to stop production because of a chip shortage. NDD's Patrick Hayden has the details. Chipmaking giant Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Co., or TSMC, says it will prioritize producing auto chips as demand rises. Germany asked Taiwan to persuade its chip makers to help ease the shortage, which is obstructing the industry's recovery from the pandemic. On Sunday, a Taiwan ministry official spoke to senior executives about the issue. Right now, the chip maker says production capacity is full, but if it can increase capacity, it will make auto chips a priority. Global reduction in chip making has created a chip shortage. This has caused some car production lines to shut down. The shortage has affected Volkswagen, Ford, Toyota, Subaru, Nissan, Fiat Chrysler and others. Taiwan confirmed they received similar requests from the US and the EU late last year and early this year from Germany and Japan. Last year, auto chips only accounted for 3% of TSMC's production. The chip-making industry has always struggled to keep up with sudden demand spikes. The factories cost tens of billions of dollars to build, and it can take up to a year to expand capacity. Reporting by Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Now we turn to some viewer questions. Someone asked previously if there's a food shortage in China. That's after we ran a story about residents in northeastern China who are facing a food crisis. To clarify, the city doesn't seem to have a food shortage. Residents there are running out of food because they're put under lockdowns. And authorities don't allow them to go out to get groceries. Authorities promised earlier there would be grocery deliveries from community workers. But many local residents say no one sent them anything. And that's all for today's China In Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow. Hi, we're happy to announce that you can also catch us on cable TV now. Millions of households already choose us as one of their trusted news sources, and you can too. You can watch us in Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, and many other cities as well. And if your system doesn't carry NTD yet, you can just give them a quick call and request NTD on your cable provider. Thank you for watching. See you next time.